Hi, everybody. Can you see me? I hope you can see me. Sorry about this delay. It was a big... Hi, everybody. Can you see me? I hope you can see me. Sorry about this delay. It was a big... Hi, everybody. Can you see me? I hope you can see me. Sorry about this delay. It was a big... Hi, Okay, so there's a little bit of echo. I hope it's not a problem now. I fixed it. I turned off the sound. Okay, so there's sound. a little bit of echo. I hope it's not a problem now. I fixed it. I turned off. And now uh, it should all work. So I'm not in my home. This is not, I am at home, but this is not my home. I just, it's just a background that's being generated because it's a mess behind me. So that's why. Uh, so uh, starting from this week, because of everything you know is happening here and in the world, we have to do this. We have to live stream. And in the future, maybe in order to avoid live streaming, because I wanted to do polling and I wanted to do some kind of question and answer in the chat session, but because I had to delete the stream, uh, which didn't work because it was set to full HD and this is not full HD. So I had to, uh, I had, I cannot give you the polls. I cannot give you the questions. Uh, Murphy's Law, what can I say? Murphy's Law. So uh, instead of that, uh, let me just tell you how uh, then we can work and you can tell me by email or I can send, um, let's say, a poll or a quiz so that we determine if you are all okay with this. So instead of this live streaming, which seems to have issues, uh, we just saw it, uh, YouTube does it, YouTube doesn't do it. So instead of this, uh, my suggestion is that I upload YouTube videos every week. I record this at home with this background or some other background. You watch it and then at the end of each video you have homework. You do homework and then I upload the key to the homework. And when we... Uh, do this regularly we have almost like a normal normal uh, schedule and normal lectures so uh, on top of that uh, i will be sending you an invite so this invite will be for office hours so on tuesdays and thursdays I will be available from 5 to 6 on Tuesdays and from 5.30 to 6 or 5 to 6 again on Google Meet. So you will get an invite and then I will be here online and in the invite you will have the link. So you just click on the link and if there is something you want to discuss, we can do it almost as if you were in the office and we were together face to face. So without much further ado, let me go to the slides. So I think and I hope you can see my screen. And this is our fourth lecture. So as you are probably aware, so uh, we had to make changes to the schedule. I was in Germany. Then we had a normal lecture and now we have this streaming lecture. So um, you can leave comments, questions and everything in the chat session. I cannot see it right now because I'm presenting, but everything you put in there, I will be able to read later. So if you have any concerns, additional ideas, comments, just let me know. So starting from this week, this will be YouTube plus combination of Google Sites and your homework. And we can actually do everything except for the midterm because most likely the emergency 
state, uh, the state of emergency, sorry, uh, will not be uh, cancelled before at least mid or late April. So we'll see what happens. The official, uh, let's say, regulation that is currently um, valid for all students is that uh, there are no exams. So there will be no April exam. Maybe I can switch to Serbian for this part. Znači, nema ispita uopšte, nema kolokvijuma, nema ničega što ima veze sa ispitivanjem. Razlog za to je što naš zakon ne dozvoljava ispitivanje preko interneta. So, distance learning is okay, but distance testing is not okay, and it makes sense. Dodatno, također nije jasno šta će se dešavati ako se ovo produži do juna, ali svi se nadamo da se neće produžiti do juna. So, there will be no midterm right now. We will hope that there will be a midterm in May, but let's see. Right now, our focus is simply on grammar and finishing the course. So everything can be on schedule and let's hope that we will have normal exams in June. So as I mentioned, we will be using YouTube and Google sites for the lecture. Uh, so you will be able to watch these lectures afterwards. Uh, after this week, there will be no additional live streams. I will simply upload the presentations. As I mentioned, practice classes will be offline. So at the end of this presentation, I will introduce you to your homework. Then you can do it at home. And then next week you get the key and you can check for yourselves what you did okay or what you didn't do okay. And then, you know, relearn something. As I mentioned, finally, Google Meet will be used for office hours. So you will get an invite. So every Tuesday and Thursday from 5 to 6 and 5.30 to 6.30 on Google Meet. You can talk to me. Uh, we can exchange files also. Google Meet has a relatively rudimentary chat uh, capabilities, so we can do it uh, like that. And finally, we get to the lecture, and this is the review. So what did we, what did, we do last week? So last week, uh, we talked about locative inversion, how it was fundamentally limited to adverbs and in particular adverbials actually of place with verbs such as be, come, go, sit, lie and stand. Examples are here comes the taxi. And then we also introduced and very briefly mentioned the negative inversion. Uh, which triggers obligatory word order change. So that's the difference between locative inversion and negative inversion. So locative inversion has no subject operator uh, inversion. There's no operator introduced with negative inversion. You actually get do support and the operator, subject operator inversion. Uh, then we talked about comparison, uh, and we mentioned that there are two types of it, comparison equivalence and non-equivalence, as two basic types. And then we also talked about subtypes to higher degree, to lower degree, so comparison of sufficiency and comparison of excess. And I told you that you have a big, big mistake in your workbook, so don't uh, learn from the workbook, learn from these slides. Comparison of the sufficiency and excess have been swapped in your workbook. So uh, finally, we introduced the prepositional phrase. I told you that it's like a parasite. It needs to cling on to something. And what it clings on is either a noun phrase or an adverb phrase, sometimes clauses. So it's an exocentric phrase. What do we mean by that? The phrase cannot survive with just the head. Unlike noun phrases where you can see, say, a tiger or a magnificent tiger basking in the sun, with prepositional phrases, that's not possible. You can say in, but then you have to continue. You cannot stay, you cannot say, I am go, I'm living in. You have to say where, in Novi Sad. So prepositional phrases need something as a complement. And heads of prepositional phrases are prepositions which are closed system words. 
and we talked about the form of the phrase that it always has post modification sometimes pre modification and you have the examples here okay so Okay, so Olga is just saying that on uh, because of the comments that you are making because on the mobile phones it's not purely really visible what's happening on the screen because there are many comments. So, you know, it's nice that you're commenting, I'll read it later. But those of us that are maybe listening or watching from, um, let's say, cell phones, as Olga is, almost half of the screen is covered by your comments, which is nice. You're being interactive, but maybe, maybe not too good for people who only have cell phones right now and are not at home. But it's up to you, of course. Uh, this will be available on offline on YouTube, so uh, maybe you know there there will be no comments. So uh, that brings us to the topics for today, and today we will try to finish the prepositional phrase with its functions and meanings, and then I will try to introduce you to adverbials, and this will be it. Uh, so, uh, what I would also like to do here is I would like and really try to prepare you for the oral exam. There will be an oral exam at some point uh, later this year. So, in the oral exam you will have to present more or less the way I'm trying to present to you right now and introduce uh, some of these concepts in a form of the oral answer that covers the fundamentals. So let's start with the functions. So uh, functions of prepositional phrases are relatively um, numerous. So there are many of them. And okay. So, um, what uh, functions of PP uh, should be in the oral exam is you focus on what prepositional phrases do in the sentence. So, that's actually the key. If you're doing this in the oral exam, your task is to explain when you see a prepositional phrase in a sentence, what is its function? What does it do in a sentence? And uh, when it comes to prepositional phrases, as I mentioned, they are very versatile. Like all uh, phrases that we've covered so far, prepositional phrases can be independent and dependent. But here we also have an additional function, just like we had an additional function with adverbs, they can be particles of phrasal verbs. Uh, there is some lack of consensus whether these phrasal verbs that contain uh, prepositional particles, whether those particles are really prepositional phrases, because in a way they are more attached to the verb, but the consensus, the let's say the majority of linguists agree that they are phrasal particles, so they belong to the verb and they are prepositions. So, when prepositional phrases are independent, they are sentence elements. And when they are sentence elements, they can be primarily adverbials. Very rarely, they can be subject and object complement, and even more rarely, they can be subjects. So, when they are adverbials, it's something like adjunct, conjunct, and disjunct. He lives in the village, in a nutshell, she's okay. To my surprise, she's okay. When they are subject complements and object complements, we did that. The place by Webster, the fences of wood, I consider them at great risk. And very rarely they can be subjects. That's something like, in my house is where I want to be, or actually right now, in our houses is where we all 
are due to the pandemic. Uh, when uh, prepositional phrases are parts of another phrase, and this is something that we didn't cover in details, neither in lecture, the previous lecture, nor in practice classes, it is usually the part of a noun phrase, but it can also be part of an adjective phrase. And we did mention this in practice classes. It can also be a third subtype. So prepositional phrase can be also part of an adverb phrase. So part of a noun phrase, something like the girl with the funny red hat, part of an adjective phrase, complex beyond your expectations and faster than John is a prepositional phrase inside an adverb phrase. Uh, so what we really haven't done is we haven't looked at the third type of the prepositional phrase uh, function, and that's the prepositional particle of a phrasal verb. So if you compare the sentence, she looked after the children and she came after the children, in she looked after the children, you would normally say that the verb is look after. So very, whereas when you say she came after the children, the verb phrase is just came and after is not really part of a verb phrase, it's part of a prepositional phrase. And this, let's say, possibility for the prepositional phrase to be part of a verb phrase is this third function. So it's neither a sentence element, it's not part of a sentence element, it's actually part of the verb phrase, and this is what gives you the possibility to have phrasal verbs. So these are combinations of verbs followed by particles that change the initial meaning of the verb. The biggest obstacle that you're going to have in your practice, let's say, as linguists, in your practice as translators, in your practice as copywriters or linguists generally, uh, is how to distinguish between phrasal particles that are adverbs and phrasal particles that are prepositions. Because phrasal, phrasal verbs are actually a mixed bag. There are phrasal verbs that have adverb particles and phrasal verbs that have prepositional particles. The only way to decide which is which is to do a test. So let's compare these sentences. He looked after the children, and then you say he looked them after, or he looked after them. And then you compare he looked up the word, and you transform it into he looked it up, or he looked up it one of each transformed sentences is wrong. And this is actually the only test that you can use to determine whether something is a prepositional particle or a phrasal uh, or an adverb particle or phrasal verb. So when you say he looked after the children and you substitute the object with a pronoun, the correct uh, thing to say is he looked after them. That's actually a prepositional particle. Why? Because then this after them looks like a prepositional phrase. When you substitute the object, like the word, with the pronoun, it, you don't say he looked up it because it's not a preposition. You say he looked it up because it's an adverb particle. And that is actually the test. So when you take an object of a phrasal verb and you substitute it with a pronoun, if you keep the particle in front of the pronoun, then it's a preposition because it behaves like a prepositional phrase. He looked after them. After them is a PP. If you substitute it with a pronoun and it ends up between the verb and the particle, like he looked it up, he googled it up, it's an adverb particle. And that's it. So you will have to do this in the written exam. Maybe you will have to do it in the oral exam. And this is the only test. Of course, there is a big issue here. And that is that some phrasal verbs are not transitive. So you cannot put 
a pronoun because the verb doesn't take an object. Well, in those cases, you have to trust your intuition, and this is an open debate among lexicologists and linguists, how we classify particles in those instances, but they are really, really rare. So let's look at another example that should be very good in illustrating this. They are tearing up the street. They are tearing up the street can be represented with two completely different images or photos as that you see here. So in one sentence, you will say they are tearing it up. In the other, you will say they are tearing up it. So in one sentence, it's an adverb particle. In the other sentence, it is a prepositional particle. The question mark in front of it indicates that this is a bit stretch example, but the native speakers I talked to agree that in this context, it more or less works. So which of these meanings is they are tearing it up and which of these meanings is they are tearing up it? Well, since we cannot be interactive here, uh, that tearing it up is an adverb particle, and in that meaning, this verb means that they are demolishing the street. They are tearing up it, uh, they are tearing up the street, means that they are running up the street and they are tearing up their shoes in a way. They are run, running so fast that they are tearing up their shoes. So this one is a prepositional particle. And that's, for example, one of the rare instances where one and the same word, up, can act as an adverb and a prepositional particle. And you fundamentally have two phrasal verbs with two different meanings and two different syntactic behaviors. Uh, so sometimes the prepositional particle doesn't change the meaning. So far, it always changed the meaning in all the examples, but sometimes what changes is the verb class. So if you look at the verb agreed, agreed by itself or agreed by itself is an intransitive verb. They agreed, nothing else, full stop, that's enough. They agreed to the plan is no longer intransitive. The plan was agreed to, so this proves the fact that I just passivized this sentence, that the plan is actually the object. You can only passivize transitive verbs that have objects. So adding the prepositional particle more or less makes this verb, not more or less, truly makes this verb transitive. It is a transitive verb. So sometimes what i'm trying to tell you is that the prepositional phrase or the prepositional particle will not create a phrase of verb it will just create a new layer on top of the original verb and some changes in the verb class finally prepositional phrases as you can see on the screen have some restrictions when it comes to the passive voice the result was eventually arrived at is okay because it's figurative, but if you say the stadium was eventually arrived at, that's not okay because the stadium is concrete and this way you uh, create an ungrammatical sentence. We discussed this when we talked about the passive voice and the restrictions on the passive voice. With this, we finish the functions of the prepositional phrase. So what's remaining now to be done uh, is prepositional meanings and intro to adverbials. Uh, I already showed you these slides last week, but let me show them again because they really highlight the main problem with prepositions from the point of view of non-native speakers. It's to the moon and it's actually not to the moon. You should say at the moon. So it's not to the moon, the dog howls at the moon. Uh, these ducks are not online, they are in line. If they are on their computers, it's only then that they are online. 
and this cat is not in the table it's on the table for serbian speakers this is not a problem but for some non uh, let's say speakers of languages that are not uh, in the european languages this can be a problem so what we are now going into is the most complex theoretical section on prepositions it's something that you simply have to memorize but there is a system and it will help you later especially when it comes to adverbials so this is something that you probably do not want to have as your oral exam question but nonetheless if you get it this what follows is more or less an extended answer to it you can summarize it in something like 10 minutes or 5 minutes so this is not a simple question in the oral exam this requires more than two minutes even up depending on how many examples you have this can last for up to 10 minutes to answer to this question so uh, let's uh, dive into semantic classification of prepositions and there are several basic prepositional meanings but they all evolved from space so the basic prepositional meaning was always evolutionary space prepositions were always about locating stuff in space then from space uh, the meaning of time evolved uh, what do i mean by that uh, so if you are let's say um, on the top of the hill that's space but if the lecture is on tuesday that's like location on the calendar like on the top of the hill uh instead of top of the hill you have tuesday so this is how evolutionary speaking uh lang and when you talk about evolution i mean language evolution this is how time developed so some nouns had originally spatial meaning and then when we created temporal meanings we also created prepositional phrases that can denote time uh, out of that uh, we created process prepositional meanings and that's something like uh you know um let's say instead of on tuesday or in the bus you say in progress so in progress is like process uh then there's contingency which is like conditional meaning and finally like every other classification you have also other meanings uh, how complex this is is best explained by this uh, let's say slide deck so here you have um, you have two images who is at the bank well that question cannot be answered by both images only one of the images is a let's say a proper answer for who is at the bank so is the robber at the bank or is the bold gentleman taking some money from the bank at the bank the correct answer is that the robbers are in the bank and truly the bold gentleman is at the bank why because uh, at the bank means that you're using the bank for its intended purpose for example you're at university right now you're not at university you are at homes but that's the idea so at in means you're at home uh at home implies that this is the intended meaning in the sense that you are at home and this is the place where you spend most of your time the robbers are in the bank because robbers do not normally spend most of their free time in the bank so this is temporary this is not just general stuff and it is not general stuff this is just let's say a temporary location and that's why you say in the bank uh which horse is in the field the one being ridden by the indian or 
the one that's running free? Uh, well, uh, the correct answer is actually the one being written by the Indian. Why? Because in means that you don't think of the field as a limitless, you know, savanna or uh, prairie that stretches as far as, as, and as wide as the eye can see. In implies that there are boundaries, there are fences, you're in the box in a way. Uh, so in means that this is the field with some boundaries. This horse that's running freely is on the field. On means that you don't consider the field to be something fenced, something that has boundaries. You see the field as a limitless surface that stretches in all directions as far as the eye can see. And this is when you want to talk, let's say, about freedom horses or horses running free and you get romantic in these sentences. Uh, finally, uh, this, these slides, I made them last week because I was thinking that we will be doing this uh, at university, but it didn't happen and I didn't change the slide. So uh, if I ask, where is the student? Uh, depending on which preposition you use, you send a completely different message on where the student is and what the student is doing. So the student is on the Faculty of Philosophy has one meaning. The student is in the Faculty of Philosophy has another meaning. And the student is at the Faculty of Philosophy has yet another third meaning. So if the student is on the Faculty of Philosophy, it's something like this house on top of another house. If you're on the faculty philosophy, you're on top of the faculty building. I don't know what you would be doing there, but that's the meaning that you get if you say that you're on the faculty of philosophy. If you're in the faculty of philosophy, you're not learning. You're not doing something that is the prim primary purpose of the building, so education. If you're in the faculty of philosophy, and you are the student, you may not be the student of the faculty. You may be the student of, let's say, high school of economics or uh, finances who just came to buy something from the vending machine. So you are just physically in the building. If you are at a lecture, then you say you are a student and you are at the Faculty of Philosophy. So if you're attending the lecture, if you're using the building for its intended purpose, then you say at. So all these examples uh, are just here to show you how complex this whole topic of prepositional meanings is because the wrong use of the preposition from the point of view of native speakers can send a completely wrong or misleading information. Uh, by the way, I would like to make a short digression about the gentleman in the photo on the right hand side of this slide. That's actually Steven Pinker. Uh, and uh, although this is a lecture for, let's say, grammar of English uh, too, uh, it's good for you to know that uh, He's one of the three greatest linguists alive. And some of his books that I encourage you to read are The Language Instinct, also The Words and Rules, What are the Ingredients of Language? Also, another very good, good book is The Stuff of Thought and How Language Provides an Insight into Human Nature. And he also has some dirty books like The Seven Words You Can't Say on Television. This is about the F and A words and some other words. So these are all really good books, except for this one, which is a little bit hard to read, but is actually very good. Uh, you should read it last. It's the blank slate and how we actually deny our own nature. So... Uh, 
the choosing uh, that we have to make about prepositional uh, meanings is intuitive for native speakers. For non-native speakers, this is one of the biggest problems if you want to achieve native-like proficiency. And this is the reason why we spend so much time talking about the meanings of prepositions. So uh, we don't have enough time for this. Uh, this is a course which is a general course on English grammar. But I can direct you to many great books on prepositions. Uh, and in particular, these ones. So if you want to practice prepositions, this is a wonderful book, The Ins and Outs of Prepositions. It's a little bit old, but prepositions haven't changed in centuries. So it's still absolutely valid. And it also includes the key to all the exercises. If you want to understand, not just memorize how these things work, you have this wonderful book, English Prepositions Explained, which really explains how you should use prepositions. This one is more recent, 10 years old. But again, as I mentioned, all these books are OK, even 50 year old books, because prepositions haven't really changed that much. So let's go back to prepositional meanings. All the slides so far only served the purpose to tell you and show you how the prepositional meanings uh, represent a really complex topic. As we mentioned, there are fundamentally four of them, space, time, process, contingency, and other meanings. The biggest amount of time we will devote to space. Why? As I mentioned, because space was the original meaning of prepositions. All other meanings evolved from the spatial meaning. So, fundamentally, you can always start the oral e examination by saying prepositional phrases and prepositions inside these phrases express a wide range of meaning. But you can also continue this sentence by saying that all these meanings can always be reduced to pure notions of physical space. All other meanings are just metaphorical or figurative derivations from the physical space. So he's in the house, he climb up the hill, that's physical. Then you can expand it to metaphorical or figurative, let's say, domain and say he's in danger. Danger is not a physical space, it's a concept. But you extend the physical idea of being somewhere to danger, which is an abstract concept or an idea. He climbed up the social scale. There is no social scale that you can literally climb. So this is another good, ex uh, let's say, example of figurative or metaphorical extension of the basic meaning. So all other meanings except for space are just extensions of the spatial meaning. So let's talk about space not as a space force, not as the universe, uh, but space as a physical location in grammar. So there are fundamentally two criteria how you classify space. The first criterion is type of the reference point and whether it's static or dynamic position in regard to that reference point. So. If you get this question, like prepositional phrases and prepositions denoting space, this table summarizes what you are supposed to say. Uh, so fundamentally, if you look at the left hand column, you have the type of reference point. So when you talk about uh, space, you are actually always talking about either the point, line or surface or area and volume. So point, when you say London, it's a point because on a map, it's a point. In your mind, London is one point, one place, one pin on a map where you may want to go. Another type of reference point is line of surface. Line and surface are not identical mathematically. 
uh, and if you think about geometry, they are definitely different. But we are not here to talk about geometry. So in language, line and surface behave more or less the same. So surface is a table. So it's like an area that has boundaries. Line is also in this category. Why? Because line always has some thickness. So it's like a surface, a very you know, thick line, think of street, is actually like, you know, like a table that you stretch to very long distance. And finally, the third type of reference point is area or volume. Here we have examples of box or room. So these are really three-dimensional spaces. So point is a single point. Line or surface is something two-dimensional that is more than a point. An area or volume is something that is three-dimensional and has some kind of a boundary that goes up from the surface. And then you combine that reference point with the location, direction, and passage as the relationship to the reference point. So if you're static, you are in London or you moved away from London. If you are in a movement and you are moving towards that point, you say you're moving to London or you are, you know, moving away from London. So here it's very similar. And if you are, for example, in an RV and you're making a road trip, you're driving past Colorado Springs. That's passage by a point. The same applies to line, surface, area, and volume. So you are, let's say, a waiter, and you put something on the table. So you put it on this surface. If you are, let's say, a pilot, you are landing on the runway five. Runway is like a line. And if you are, again, a pilot, you're flying across the Pacific Ocean. This can be also negative if, the, for example, the glass fell off the table and you, let's say, moved off the runway. But this is, I think, logical. And the last meaning is area volume plus location, direction and passage. So you're in your room, that's location in the volume you are a superman and you flew into the room so you broke the wall and flew into the room or again if you're superman you can fly through the room so this implies that you broke the walls and simply flew through the room and these are actually the examples that you should also provide in the oral exam so you should explain how we understand the type of reference point and how we understand the position either as being static or dynamic in relationship to the reference point. So here um, I have additional slides that explain uh, spatial relations as two main kinds. So location and direction. Uh, so this is another, let's say, way of looking at space as a physical property expressed by prepositions. And uh, this is more, let's say, aimed at English use, how you use the English language. So uh, prepositions that denote location are, let's say, static. They usually appear with verbs describing states in particular the verb be, whereas those prepositions that express direction occur with verbs of motion. But in the following slides, I want to focus on at, in, and on because they are the prepositions that cause the biggest amount of difficulties. So let's go and discuss at, in, and on. So, uh, as we already discussed, the three classes of concepts from geometry, point, surface, area, or volume 
are the ones which we use to describe the meanings of prepositions, but we will not go into this again. This slide is here only for the sake of you being able to read what I explained in the first slide uh, on the dimensions and the reference points. So the general idea for at, on, and in as the three most common prepositions is that at is always referring to a point. So whenever you use at, the idea is you are located at a point. When you use on, the idea is surface, but unlimited, two dimensions, like the whole planet, you're on planet Earth, you're on the surface of the planet Earth. In is for area and volume. It's like surface, but with boundaries. So it's not unlimited theoretically, it's always limited. So that's uh, the main, let's say, idea or the main uh, meanings expressed by at, on, and in. So at is always referring to points on surface and in area and volume. Uh, so when you say my car is at the house, you're not actually answering anything different than where is, let's say, my car. But the implications of using different prepositions are what I want to focus your attention to. So in this case, if you say, where is the car? And you say, my car is at the house. Of course, it's not on top of the house. At the house implies that it's near to the house. So it's at the point where you normally expect it to be. So the house is seen as your, let's say, anchor point. Your life revolves around the house. So the car is at the house. That's like the general point where the car is located uh, on a map, you could say. Uh, but when you say, where is the car or where is the roof? The roof is on the house. There's a new roof on the house. This is no longer point. You understand that the house is, let's say, a three-dimensional object that has to be covered. So the roof is on the house you imply that it covers the surface area of the house, not a point. And when you say, where is the house? And you say it's in Tippecano County, it's no longer on, it's in because the county has boundaries. So there are borders on the map and that's why you say in. Uh, that's also why you say there are five rooms in the house because the house is seen as a volume, three-dimensional, and which has a lovely fireplace in the living room because the living room is again seen as a three-dimensional space. You may now say, wow, why are you telling us this? This is so straightforward. This is so simple. We know this. We are not stupid. We are not idiots. Well, uh, this is very straightforward for us as speakers of uh, Indo-European languages. The prepositions were completely different in some other languages. Many of our students do not end up working uh, in Serbia, or maybe they end up working in Serbia, but they do not teach Serbian kids English. Many of our students teach people from China, from Taiwan, from Japan, from Thailand. So there's a whole industry uh, of online lectures and one of the biggest issues in those classes is prepositions because in non-Indo-European languages prepositional phrases are not even always existent. In some languages you have postpositions and the meanings are not identical, especially not identical to the meanings of prepositions in English. So this summary here is something that you can always use to teach your non, let's say, Indo-European teachers of, non-Indo-European students of English, how to use prepositions. Uh, so let's focus now on at, the first of the notorious three. Uh, Tom is waiting for his sister at the bank. At is seen here as a 
point on a map where Tom is waiting. So again, this is not like on top of the bank. At is simply think of it as a point on a map. In Google Maps, you will always see say, ah, it's at that point. Or it's, you know, at this point is where we want to get. Uh, when you say suspend the whole afternoon at the fair, it's still at, although the fair is much bigger than the bank because you don't measure point by its size. As long as you think of something as a point on a map, it doesn't matter whether it's London and it covers a huge area on the map or it's a bank, it's still a point. So don't think about the size. Think about simply are you talking about location. And this is the basic meaning of at. But at does not always refer to location. It's its, let's say, prototypical meaning. It can also refer to the destination. So you arrived at the house. That's the final point on your itinerary. That's the way, that's the place, the point at which you stop. And that's why you say at. It's a point, like a navigational point, the final one on the list. The waiter was at our table immediately. It's the point on a map of, let's say, the restaurant, and this guy moved to that point. So it's still a point, it's just that it's not stationary, it's actually just a movement to the point. And then you can also combine it with direction. So in this case, it's very similar. It's just the difference between destination and direction is that you can go in a certain direction, but that direction can be in the opposite way of your final destination. But you will make a U-turn and come back. Destination is the final stop. Direction is your current heading, but it can change later. So the policeman leaped at the ass assailant is just a direction. So it's not his final destination. The final destination is the jail. So this is just direction. The dog jump at my face. Hopefully the dog didn't reach your face. That's another thing about direction. It usually implies that you didn't really arrive at that place identified by the preposition at. So you may be moved. In and on are less complex. So when you talk about on and in, you have to always bear in mind that they either refer to surface, that's on, or area, that's in. So if you have players in the field, that's not very pos that's not very likely. You have to have players on the field. Uh, if they are in nature, because, uh, you know, then there are no boundaries. But if you have professional players, then they are probably in the field because there are some boundaries. Uh, the cows are grazing not on the field, they are probably grazing in the field. Cows are not free to roam. Cows are always in enclosed areas. So, the difference between surface and area is that it has boundaries. Uh, when you talk about on and in, uh, you can actually, uh, in the following example, see how different the message is depending on whether you say on or in. Uh, if you have frost, you say the frost made patterns on the window. It means that the patterns are on the surface of the window. But if you use in, you don't treat the window as a surface. You treat it as an area. You assume that the window has certain thickness. So if a face appeared in the window, that's like a ghost. It's like an apparition. So there is a face in the window, in this substance of the window inside the glass so it's like horror movies and the only difference is whether you say on or in on is normal in that's more like ghost movies because you treat window the window as a volume or area and the same applies to you know uh, similar 
uh, examples to the ones which I already showed you. So the sheep are grazing in the pasture, it's enclosed, the cattle are grazing on the open range, there's no fence. The players are on the basketball court if it's not enclosed, but they are in the basketball court if it's enclosed. Three players are on the soccer field, it's somewhere in the field where there are no boundaries, but normally, actually in real life, the three players are in the soccer field. But for example, for box, it's always in because the ring is always enclosed by ropes. Uh, similarly, the children are playing in the street because it's, you know, like a volume that's surrounded by uh, fences, like here, although here you don't actually see that it's that the street is actually lower than the pavement and our house is on the third street it's like you treat a street as a surface that extends or a line that extends in the distance uh, finally in and on have very special meanings when it comes to transportation so in is used with a car whereas on is with public or commercial means of transport. So that's why I say I'm in the car, but I'm on the bus, I'm on the plane, I'm on the train. And these are all the places where I shouldn't be right now because of the pandemic, especially not on the ship uh, or a cruise ship. But this is uh, the basic classification. So in car, on public or commercial means of transportation. So in is like personal. Uh, transportation and this is not uh, true for all varieties of English but some speakers of English make a further distinction for uh, public modes of transport where in is used for stationary situations and on is used for motion let me show you the example my wife stayed in the bus while I got at, while I got out at the rest stop so this implies that the wife didn't jump out of the running vehicle. It implies that the bus stopped and the wife stayed in. The guy went out to buy something. But the passenger sat in the play awaiting takeoff. It's actually not really stationary. You know that a plane is moving before the takeoff. The official word is taxing. So the plane is actually moving and that's why you say you're in the plane awaiting takeoff because the plane is moving. Uh, the passengers sat calmly on the plane throughout turbulence. Sorry, that's actually the right example. This is where the plane is moving, but the passenger sat in the plane awaiting takeoff, it's stationary, it's not moving. Uh, and uh, finally, there are prepositions that express movement towards something and these are combined with two. These are onto and into or just two. Uh, and two is the basic preposition of direction. That's why onto and into are extensions of that direction. So two on its own signifies the goal. Uh, onto and into are combined to uh, signify that your goal is either a surface or maybe it's an area or volume. So uh, Saeed returned to his apartment. That's like the basic direction and the point to which the Saeed returned. Onto is like that but signifies movement towards the surface you place something onto the table or you throw something into the trash can because it's movement in a three-dimensional container that's why sometimes you can actually combine them tai shing jump into the pool or just in the pool porfirio fell on the floor or onto the floor and the crab washed up on or onto the shore and this, this refers to 
uh, also completion of action. So whenever you have completion of action, Jane fell or Jean fell on or onto the floor, you are free to use either on or onto. Suzumu dived into the water. But if you are not talking about the action, if there is no direction, if it's like position, then onto and into are not uh, good options. This is again a very important piece of information for your non-native um, speakers of, let's say, Indo-European languages. So, in and on are always for stationary, uh, let's say, positions. Into and onto are always for action. Which brings us to time, and we will soon finish this class because actually now I think that I think of it, there's no point in introducing adverbial, uh, adverbials as a new topic. Uh, maybe it's better if videos on YouTube correspond to a single topic. So let's do uh, just the prepositional phrases and finish them. Unlike the discussion on space, the discussion on time will be much shorter. Why? Because time, as I mentioned, is just the extension of space. And unlike the nine possibilities for type of reference point and relationship to the reference point for space, for time, you only have two fundamental meanings, location in time. And location in time is everything that is the answer to the question when. When is the event? On Monday. Uh, when did it happen? After nightfall. The second meaning is duration. Duration is everything that is the answer to the question, how long? It lasted for eight hours. It uh, went on throughout the night. There are two subtypes of duration, forward span, when you talk about duration into the future, so we will finish this by Friday, or backward span. Uh, construction workers have been making terrible noises since this morning. Uh, again, just like space, uh, time, which is extended from space, can identify point in time. One point in time is something like, I will see you on Monday, or the week begins on Sunday. But uh, depending on that point, you may not always use on. Uh, sometimes you may use at. My plane leaves at noon. The movie starts at six. And sometimes you will use in. He likes to read in the afternoon or the days are long in August. Uh, what it depends on? Well, it depends actually on the type of point. So if the point is just day, days are always preceded by the preposition on. If you have noon, night, midnight, or any other exact time of day, why is noon exact? Well, it's 12 p.m. Night uh, is, you know, you know when the night starts. Midnight is exactly uh, zero, zero hours. And afternoon, uh, August 1999, they all go within as a preposition because they are other parts of the day that include the large sections of time, months, years, seasons, they all go within. Uh, in addition to point in time, you can talk about extended time as well. Extended time is expressed usually by since or combined prepositions like from, to, from, until. Uh, so she has been gone since yesterday so and has not returned that's the implication i'm going to paris for the two weeks heaven forbid it's on the lockdown these days the movie showed from august to october so these are all examples of extended time uh, sometimes you have a single preposition like within a year sometimes two from spring until fall and that's it that i can that's it that's all i can tell about um, time uh, process prepositions are uh, classified into five groups and your workbook is really good in this uh, in this case it's the classification here is spot on so there are five types of process prepositions those that describe manner 
So that's, I treated him in a friendly way. How you treated him, that's manner. How, like a brother, you treated him with great affection. The other meaning of process is instrument, what you used to actually conduct the process. So he examined it with a microscope. The question is still how he examined it, but here the answer focuses on the tool which was used to perform the process. Means is I go to work by bus or she influenced me by her example. How is this different from instrument? This is also how I go to work, how she influenced me. Well, uh, this is not the instrument because if you go to work by bus, you don't drive the bus. You are being driven on the bus. So by bus and by her example are means because you are not in control of what's used for that process. So bus is used for the process. It's like the instrument, but you're not using it. That's the difference between means and instrument. They're very similar. It's just matters who's using it. If the subject is using it, it's the instrument. If it's not operated by the subject, it's means. Agent is actually what you get in the by phrase. Penicillin was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming. That's actually who did something. Uh, that's usually the by phrase in the passive sentences. And the fifth type of the process preposition is stimulus. I'm surprised at her attitude. So this again is more like um, uh, what? Uh, what surprised you? Uh, her attitude. What were you surprised by? By her attitude. So uh, that's it for when it comes to process prepositions and uh, the penultimate group of prepositions are contingency prepositions. Contingency if you haven't looked it up in the dictionary, means a future event or circumstance which is possible but cannot be predicted with certainty. So this is something that may or may, may not happen. So that's like the absence of certainty, something that is likely or less likely, something that is in Serbian eventualnost. So, uh, contingency is classified into four groups. The first one is cause and reason. They are not exactly the same, but we will talk about their dif the differences be between cause and reason uh, when we talk about adverbials. Fundamentally, cause and reason are what led to the process. So, let's say because of his laziness he lost the job so the job was lost because of the laziness so that was the cause of the job loss uh, unlike cause and reason uh, purpose and goal are actually within the control of the subject so uh, he did it for his daughter so he had this purpose of doing it for the daughter. So purpose and goal is what you want to achieve. Concession in Serbian dopusno uh, means that you are actually allowing for the unlikely outcome. So for example, in spite of her hard work, she failed the exam. So if she worked hard, you would expect that she would uh, pass the exam, but she failed it. So that's concession. You allow for the less likely outcome. In Serbian, as I mentioned, this is called dopusno znaczenje. And the final meaning of contingency is condition. But for, except for, but for me, the case would have been lost. So you can always paraphrase this with conditional clauses, if it were not for me or if it had not been for me the case would have been lost. There are other meanings, and this is the last topic for today. Uh, these are accompaniment, she lives with her parents, and respect, something like, uh, as for the shoes, I don't think they become it, but the outfit is nice. And with that, we finish the prepositional meanings, and uh, we actually got to the beginning of adverbials, but we will not do the adverbials now. We will actually uh, go to the end of this presentation. 
So uh, here, uh, the end of the presentation is homework. Uh, now that we finished the prepositional phrase, you should try to work as hard as you can on finishing the exercises. So all these things that I talked about are the focus of the exercises that are on this slide. So I ask you to finish the second exercise if you haven't finished it. The second exercise, I think it's page 117 or 118, uh, is about functions of the prepositional phrases. So do that. Then we already did prepositional phrase exercise number one. So that's the form of the prepositional phrase. But now, for the sake of practice, you already have all the prepositional phrases identified there and their uh, structure. So do the analysis of functions. Are they adverbials? And are they adjunct, disjuncts, and conjuncts? Or they maybe post modification or noun phrase or something else? Then do the fifth and the sixth exercise. They are about the use of prepositions. It's the introduction to the meaning of prepositions. So it's whether, you know, uh, the, the correct answer will depend on whether uh, the complement of the prepositional phrase is a point, surface area, volume, whether it's uh, space, um, whether it's time, when or time duration, whether it's uh, cause, reason, or some other contingency meaning. And then uh, in number five and six, you will practice the use of English. But then in number four, which you should do last, you will actually employ this classification that I gave you. So uh, meanings of prepositions, and you should identify the meanings expressed by prepositional phrases. So this will be the hardest exercise of them all because you have to learn this classification and then you have to apply it and you have to think about each of the, ex uh, the examples. Uh, my suggestion is ask questions. So if the question is where, uh, then it's space. Uh, if the question is when, it's time. How? Process. If it's really difficult to come up with a question, maybe it's contingency. Uh, but why, for example, is um, still cause and reason. Uh, so contingency usually doesn't have a good or a single uh, WH question. So do that. Uh, this lecture is now uh, live on the uh, favorite streaming platform of the world population, YouTube. Uh, so that's it. I will be ending the stream now and have fun uh, with your, let's say, homework. Uh, don't go outside, wash your hands, stay safe, uh, do not party. Sorry, it sounds terrible and lame, but we have to do it now. Uh, and if you have uh, you know, in your family or among your friends, medical professionals, take care of them, express them our deepest gratitude for what they are doing to protect us all from this pandemic. Uh, and that's it. So thank you for watching. Uh, and I will, I will be uploading the next presentation without the live streaming thing so bye stay safe stay healthy take care